Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our event today. Hey, tonight. Well, on behalf of the ANCR, the ANC England, thank you very much for being here. It will be St. George's Day, Saint, but also the Saint of Catalonia. And for those of who have had the chance to visit Catalonia during this festivity, you will be aware that uh, it is celebrated with a lot of enthusiasm in Catalonia. Uh, well, people, people take to the streets and buy books and roses uh, to their loved ones. Uh, well, in the end, St. George's Day is the real... Day in, in car shops, set their stalls in the streets, and writers rush to present their latest books and meet their audiences. Uh, well, St. George's Day is definitely one of the main celebrations in Catalonia that is strongly linked to its culture. And for this occasion, uh, we will be presenting today the book Lying for uh, that is, well, Lying for Unity, written by Michael Strubel, uh, who will be with us uh, in today's presentation. So we are very happy uh, of having him here tonight. Uh, let me first shortly introduce Michael himself and the book. Uh, well, Michael Struvel was born in Oxford in 1949, uh, being son of an English father and a Catalan mother uh, whose family exiled in England after the war. Uh, he holds a degree in psychology and uh, physiology from Oxford University, a master's degree in uh, psychology of education from the Institute of Education, and a degree in psychology uh, uh, from the Universidad Autónoma de Barcelona, where he also re received a diploma in advanced studies. He worked from the 1980 to 1999 for the Catalan government in the language promotion unit. And then until his retirement in 2014, he taught at the Universitat Oberta de Catalunya. During his career, uh, he has coordinated projects commissioned by the European Parliament. Uh, well, he has been very active in the research fields of language policies and sociolinguistics. Although he has never been a member of any political party, he has worked very actively in democratic movements, first towards uh, greater autonomy for Catalonia and later towards the independence of Catalonia. Well, uh, Lying for Unity is a very well documented book uh, in which Michael, the Catalan independence movement, has been attached uh, by the Spanish authorities using disinformation, manipulation, and accusations of indoctrination. Well, as he quotes in the book, to negotiate is to lose, all or nothing. This is how politics works in terms by the Spanish authorities to engage in large scale disinformation as one of its strategies to decapitate the peaceful democratic movement for the Catalan independence. The preface uh, of the book is written by Henry Ettinghausen, who is Emeritus Professor of Spanish at the University of Southampton. Uh, in the preface, uh, Henry Ettinghausen summarizes some reasons behind uh, that, that lay behind this irrational demonization of the Catalan independence movement that is perpetrated by Spain. Partially, per perhaps, because of the obscure past of Spain, which was not resolved by the Spanish transition. And sadly, we can still say that uh, there haven't been clear efforts to do so yet. Well, I don't want to spend more time in the presentation. Uh, so please, Michael, could you please start your presentation and uh, what pushed you to, to, to write this book uh, on this information towards the Catalan independence movement? Okay, well, first of all, thank you very much to you and, and Joanna for laying on this event. I really appreciate the opportunity to present the book to an English speaking, not necessarily English nationality uh, audience. Uh, that was a, a wink at Laura Crespi from ANC uh, Scotland. Uh, why did I decide to buy the book? Well, for a long, long time, I've been very concerned at the way Spain has been trying to solve what is very clearly a political conflict 
uh, but not by using democratic means. And I'll, I'll come back to that uh, because that's the, the, the centerpiece of, of the book. So I, I decided specifically to start the book uh, on about the 3rd or 4th of April uh, last year in the middle of the pandemic. So I had, let's say, plenty of time here in Palamos to uh, sit back and read. Uh, when I read uh, uh, what I regarded as a, a disgusting um, essay written by a Spaniard who ought to know better, who was extremely badly documented, who spewed venom at the whole Catalan independence movement, and at the end uh, said that uh, it was likely that the independence movement would actually gain in force thanks to the pandemic, which I thought, again, was almost a, an immoral statement and, and certainly not backed up by any, uh, any more empirical evidence than uh, a handful of tweets. I mean, it, it really is very elegantly published, but exceedingly well, uh, badly documented document. That's why I decided to write the book. So Enrique is now going to unmute himself. No, he still hasn't muted. Hey. Enrique, <laughs> this often happens. He hasn't realized he is speaking to himself, which is uh, always a, a, a good- uh, Sorry, yeah, yeah, I have a very bad uh, connection. Sorry, sorry, um, yeah. So well, yeah. Thank, thank you, Michael. Uh, 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 and I will also add. I didn't say that. Uh, please, the audience, if you have questions, please do ask them. I, we will try to to compile them and and ask uh, the our speaker. And um, well, uh, I think uh, the interest of this book uh, goes beyond those that are concerned about the Catalan coast, right? Because I mean. In the end, the problem of fake, fake news is, is, a, is, a, is a global problem. And I would like to, to quote, uh, well, one of these quotes that, that you have in the book. Well, you say, uh, authoritarian regimes are not the only or even the best at organized social media manipulation. The earliest reports of government involvement in nudging public opinion involve democracies and new innovations in political communications technologies often come from political parties uh, and arise during high profile elections. So while it is, it is a trending global problem, uh, which was very evident during the 1st of October, 2017. But in the end, I mean, you are talking about yeah, an issue that is a concern for, uh, nowadays in, in many countries. So I, I find it interesting that, well, isn't it, Michael? Mm -hmm. um, yes, in fact, the, the whole of the first part of the book is devoted to fake news and uh, manipulation of, of information, both generally across the world. I think one of the first examples of of uh, such manipulation is um, the choice of the name of an extremely cold and unhospitable large island to the west of Iceland, which was called Greenland, uh, in order to attract uh, people to go and uh, colonize it. Um, the first part of the book is devoted to a kind of general overview of uh, fake news, of the organizations set up both privately and institutionally in Spain, in Britain. In Britain, there was a, a special uh, UK Parliament inquiry into Russian, possible Russian involvement in, uh, in UK politics. Um, and then uh, I move on to uh, fake news related to an alleged Russian involvement in uh, the, the Catalan independence process, uh, which is, I think is very interesting um, because writing the book, of course, I have, I've had to dig up a lot of information. And this particular um, committee of the UK Parliament uh, actually called David Alandete from El País, Francisco de Borja Llacheras from the European Council on Foreign Relations, 
and Mira Milesovic Juaristi from Elcano Royal Institute to explain what they've been publishing in El País and elsewhere for several months um, up to that December 2017 meeting of uh, the committee, uh, uh, purporting, claiming that Russian involvement in the uh, Kafan referendum had been extremely uh, powerful and uh, effective. So, and also, I would say that, uh, I mean, the fact that, that, well, in Spain, there is very poor funding for the public media, and to get, together with the worrying lack of plur pluralism in the big Spanish media, uh, which are lobbied by a very few groups, I understand that in, we have the the optimal conditions for, for this manipulation of information, right? I mean, in the end, well, you, you cite also, well, your book is plenty of quotes and uh, references. Uh, and well, in, in your book, you compare the, the level of confidence of trust that Spaniards have in the news that are given by this media. And well, the, all the surveys agree in saying that the, Spain is at bottom levels in in, uh, uh, in reference to with regards to to confidence to, towards the the media, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that's these are the, the the proper conditions to to manipulate uh, on on your behalf. Mm -hmm. um, Isn't it? Yes, I mean the the whole way through the the book, um, I draw on published uh, articles largely by, by uh, newspaper uh, journalists um, in which it's uh, very, very clear that there is a, a kind of concerted, it, it could be genetic, you know, if you, if you don't mind me putting that way, I don't mean it literally. It may be just so ingrained in the Spanish condition that Spain cannot be divided. It is inseparable, it is united, because of the divine right of kingdoms, uh, and that anyone challenging that is, is demonized almost immediately. You find as early as 2013, uh, early as 2013, you have um, the media giving ample coverage of um, the, the uh, statement by uh, Rajoy, who at that time was the uh, conservative prime minister uh, saying that, uh, talking about the illegal referendum, when in fact, both the 2014 poll and the 2017 referendum were covered by Catalan legislation, which was okay, it was um, pulled down by the constitutional court. That is a whole other chapter, which I think remains to be written on, on Spanish lawfare, which is, uh, which would be, I hope, the uh, subject of, a, of another book. But you can see throughout that the, the um, media are uh, uh, joining up with the, the narrative of the Spanish government, reinforcing it, supporting it, uh, attending uh, police raids, you know, sort of dawn raids, uh, unknown to the Catalan police or the Catalan authorities, uh, and abundantly covered by Spanish journalists called in, you know, a few hours before to make sure that these terrible terrorists, um, the arrests of these terrible terrorists would, would be actually covered. Then it turns out that they're not terrorists, they're not making bombs, they're making fireworks, which is what they do uh, every year. And uh, or, or that uh, a, a poor girl from the Baix Llobregat called um, Carrasco uh, has, um, was not, in fact, a terrorist. She was rushed off to Madrid and accused of, of being a terrorist. And in the event, after several years, all the charges were dropped, you know. So that is a se separate chapter on lawfare, but it builds on the general public opinion developed by the media supporting the Spanish government, whether conservative or socialist, it doesn't matter, uh, in their drive to crush the Catalan independence movement, rather than sitting down and listening and studying the grievances of what turns out to be a majority of Catalan people. Well, I have an example about this medium. 
manipulation of this lack of pluralism. I mean, it's not only you who denounces that or the independentist movement. Uh, in the end, uh, uh, the same journalists of the Spanish television uh, denounced that the covering of the 1st of October uh, was very poor <laughs> and very manipulated. Uh, there is a very clear example. Let me share the screen if I can. Uh, I believe you won't be able to hear the, the, the audio. Share screen, yeah, uh, one moment. So I think, I believe you can see it, right? So that was on the news on the 1st of October in the Spanish TV. So yeah, it was while all the, well, the, the media in the world was showing the images of uh, police brutality and violence in Spain, uh, the Spanish TV, the public TV, the state TV was was showing these images of a policeman, well, offering help to uh, a man who was there protesting in a polling station. So it's basically out of the reality of what was happening that day, which is a pity in the end for the rest of the Spaniards because, um, I mean, their right of being properly informed about what happens in their country is vulnerated uh, well day by day so uh, yeah um, I mean they, they've been uh, misinformed and manipulated uh, in any treatment of the reasons behind the current phase of the Catalan independence movement which you know, I remind people uh, has existed for you know, 130 140 years. Uh, but in this particular phase, which I think is is in the strongest phase, um, the, the Spanish public opinion has not been told that the origin of this is that disastrous constitutional court ruling in, in 2010, which overturned part of the re re revised statute of autonomy, the 2006 um, statute. Well, that was a, a, a blunder in political terms, and I think you know, everything can be interpreted in any way you like, but the Spanish Constitutional Court in general has put uh, the unity of Spain before, um, let's say, um, legally tenable uh, um, tenets uh, in order to make sure that anything to do with uh, the Catalan independence movement, even talking about it in the Catalan parliament, uh, is uh, illegal and is um, therefore banned. And therefore, anyone misobeying the, uh, the Spanish Constitutional Court, uh, uh, that's contempt of court, and they can lose their jobs if they're, if they're public officials or um, polit politicians uh, in parliament. Uh, when, when you think, well, that's not what a constitutional court is for. But I repeat, the media have ensured that Spanish public opinion uh, supports any moves, any moves to um, quash the, the independent movement and have been denied the reasons for uh, the, this current phase of the, um, of the independence movement. So the media constantly talk about greed, Catalan Catalonia is, is wealthier and therefore wants to uh, remove uh, support for uh, poorer parts of, of Spain, um, that there's an, a, an alleged Catalan elite that wants to preserve their privileges. Well, they, they can't do that in an independent country. Their privileges exist within uh, uh, um, a united Spain. So that, that again falls on its hat. And Enrique, I'm sure you know that there's a, a generalized um, perception, thanks to the media, that the movement is anti-Spanish, that in fact, Spaniards love the Catalans, but uh, Catalans hate the Spaniards. Well, I mean, in the book, I include um, a, a diagram, which uh, I quote from a, a reputable uh, scientific source, which shows- Yeah, I can show that. Yeah, yeah. Hate. You cite uh, Joe Brieu, which is a very good analyst that you can find him on Twitter, always tweeting very interesting things. Yes, indeed. And, and what he shows is, in fact, that Catalans uh, regard yeah, more highly Spanish from the rest of Spain 
than uh, Spaniards from the rest of Spain regard the Catalans, who on, on a scale, you know, running down from the Andalusians who are the most admired and respected and loved people, it goes down slowly. And then even in the 90s, it went clank to the Basques and then clank to the Catalans who were bottom of the, the list. That, that exactly, well done, yeah. Enrique. Yeah. The, the, the red uh, buttons or the orange buttons are the uh, in opinion of people in other parts of Spain as regards the Catalans and the blue are the opposite. So um, the, you can see in the, in the first case, the Andalusians rate on a scale of one to um, 10, I think, um, they uh, rate the Catalans much lower than the Catalans rate the Spaniards. That there is no hate drive within the Catalan independence movement. That doesn't mean to say there are, there are tweeters who overdo it, and I, you know, I find some of their tweets repugnant, but that's on both sides, and is certainly these are particular individuals, and they're not representatives of the movement or any of the main parties. Yeah, we can we can hear this very often, right? The, the, what you were saying that the Catalans, there is a Hispanophobic root which is not evident anywhere. <laughs> In fact, both surveys demonstrate that. And one might be tempted to to think, okay, this is just the average of the whole population, but no worries, there is also uh, uh, the average of the independentist people. So people who feel who, who are independentists in Catalonia. So they are asked, what do they think about uh, the, the rest of Spain, the other communities? And mm -hmm. we again see the, the same pattern. So the independentists uh, value the others uh, better than the others uh, value the Catalans. So yeah, uh, yeah just to- Better than the others. A plus to this. Uh, to this value reason. the Catalans as yeah. a whole. Not just the yeah, pro yeah, as a whole, as a whole, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That this, I mean, this this isn't a new phenomenon. As I say, um, there's a, a very good study in the 1990s uh, on 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 this by a non a non Catalan uh, that uh, found this, and uh, earlier studies also show the same. The Catalans are at the end of the list. They're, they're not liked as much as uh, people from other parts of the peninsula. And this is related to long-standing prejudice, which uh, a non-Catalan historian has dated back to the 17th century. You know, in other words, it's a very long-standing um, phenomenon and not a single Spanish democratic uh, Spanish government has done the slightest to, um, to put amends to, 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 to put things in their popular in the right place. All we have seen are videos of um, Spanish conservative politicians trying to say why they admire the Catalans. It's all very, uh, very falsified. You have Mariano Rajoy thinking carefully and then saying, los catalanes hacen cosas. Catalans do things, you know, well, that's, if, if that's what he believes, he's saying that Spaniards don't do anything which I don't think was his intention. Mm. Uh, yeah, we have a, a, an audience question. Well, also, I also add, so in the end, this situation also adds a lot of pressure to the Catalan media, right? Because in the end, they are constantly compared with the Spanish media, uh, which, in fact, it's openly biased. Uh, it's very hard to find independent. Um, you make a claim, Enrique, because which I think I agree with. Uh, openly, but not on subjective grounds. The uh, yeah. <laughs> there are several studies done on yeah. uh, coverage of um, the the whole issue of independence, or at the time of the, of the first uh, independence poll, uh, in which it, it's very very clear public and private Spanish media yeah. uh, have virtually zero um, in, in chat shows uh, supporters of independence or people sympathetic to independence. You have someone like John Carlin, he's against independence, but he would respect the Catalans' right to independence. And John Carlin, who is a, a, a very popular 
um, commentator in, in El País, particularly, but in other media, he was dumped, he was sacked by El País for writing an article in the Times saying that he would be so and so grieved if Catalonia decided to leave Spain, but if it did, it would be the Spanish government's fault. Well, I think you know that that's a very good explanation of uh, of of the responsibility of the Spanish government or successive governments. But at the same time, I don't think most Catalans would be like most English people or most Canadians say we'd be so sorry if Scotland or Quebec left uh, the, the Union. But, you know, if they decide that, it's because the Union is not uh, meeting their, their expectations. Very few Spaniards would uh, argue that, I think. And sorry, may I add this? I ran a survey of over 2,000 people in the rest of Spain in 2009, I think it was, on the on the whole issue of independence. And um, the people who ran the, the, the survey, obviously I didn't do it myself personally, uh, a very professional team. Um, the, 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 the director of the company phoned me and he said, he said, you know, I'm aghast. I, I've asked them to recheck the results because it turned out that at that time, at that time, Spanish public opinion was much more liberal much more respective, respectful of Catalan, Catalan's opinions. So in, in a list of possible reactions of the, of the Spanish government to the decision of the Catalans to become independent, um, there were several options people could vote for, you know, uh, several of them. The, the top one was that well, the Spanish government should negotiate with the Catalans. You know, hey, uh, and the second one was well, the Spanish government must uh, respect the, the uh, decision of the, of the majority of Catalans. Uh, well, you know, that was over half the Spanish population agreed to that affirmation at that time. I doubt it's even 30% right now, and that will be because of so many Basques or Galicians or, or Valencians agreeing with that. Things have changed dramatically. At the other end, there was, you know, the option, well, Spain should intervene in, in a military way, you know. Um, well, that, that, I think it only got 11% of support. And that again was quite a shock, pleasant surprise, but quite a shock. We had an image of the Spanish public opinion, which would, uh, which would uh, agree with that affirmation in a much higher percentage. Only 11% agreed. So at that time in 2009, uh, let's say public opinion was ripe to accept a political solution to the Catalan, what is now the Catalan conflict. Um, well, we, we have a, a question from the audience from Aster Subira. Um, so she says, you talk about manipulation from Spain. Uh, do you think it is worth it to try to talk uh, to a state that tends to manipulate facts, opinions, mass media. Do you see any future to these talks? Uh, I think that there is no future. I'm not saying there shouldn't be talks. In the end, there will have to be a negotiated solution. I mean, Catalonia can't just take over uh, the whole fiscal, the tax collection system without Spain agreeing to that happening. So. Um, in the end, as any independence process, however unilaterally it starts, there has to be an agreement so that the, the, the handover of powers uh, is uh, done in a, in a civilized way. Um, so I don't know. I don't know to what extent um, we can argue on, in terms of of um, whether they manipulate or not. What I think we can argue is that Spain constantly makes promises that are not fulfilled. There was a, a lluvia de millones, a, a, a flood of millions of euros that was going to come into Catalonia in, in terms of central government investment. I say in brackets with money raised in Catalonia, but anyway. Uh, and 
that was going to be a flood of millions of euros. And people worked it out and said, well, that's what we get already. You know, so there's no flood, there's no, no substantial increase. In, in fact, you know, the Spanish government is not really offering anything. Uh, on top of that, they didn't even comply with that commitment, which was in the end to, to maintain investments. Investments in, in Catalonia have fallen short uh, every year since then. Well, in the end, well, with regards to the dialogue, in the end, I mean, while President Puigdemont was claiming for dialogue, all the unionist parties, uh, like PSOE, PP, well, the Socialist Party, uh, PP, Ciutadans, Vox, uh, they, they were all chanting Puigdemont a prisión. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, <laughs> what kind of di dialogue is it? And in the end, there is now the uh, Tablo de, de, de Negociación, the dialogue, sorry. The, uh, the dialogue table, how would, would you translate it into English? I don't know. Uh, dialogue, um, which in the end, I mean, the Socialist Party has made very clear that they will never accept the self determination uh, right. Uh, so <laughs> there is, okay, we, we can discuss things. What kind of things? <laughs> there, are, there are many red lines here to, to be discussed. So, uh, yeah, I mean, and I also believe that in the end, when Article 155 uh, was imposed, which we basically abolishes any, any type of autonomy in Catalonia, and well, it leaves the country under a kind of a colonial domination because there is no self-government. I mean, it's dominated by, by a foreign region, Madrid. Uh, well, I mean, I believe that this narrative is a bit uh, is a stronger, is a bit hardened, right? I, I mean, as does the, the repression situation is also in, uh, in parallel. Is also, I mean, it seems that there is no limit on what they can do. Uh, so they, they, they don't need to, to accept any, anything. Um, you talk about Article 155, but I talk about the application of Article 155, which says, it doesn't say that the Spanish government can uh, close down a regional parliament or, or, or expel uh, regional um, government. I mean, it, it says nothing of that sort. It just says that measures have to be taken to force the uh, regional government or parliament to adhere to whatever the central government can claim to be constitutional. Um, and it, it's very interesting. I look back um, because someone pointed it out to me. I look back at the minutes of the uh, Cong Spanish Congress session in which that particular article was subjected to a number of amendments uh, in, the, in, the, um, in, in the phase in which the constitution was being first drafted. And there, there was one particular amendment which said, um, this, this article will allow the Spanish government to um, close down parliaments and expel uh, regional um, governments. Well, that was turned down, in other words, the Spanish Congress deliberately said that that was not to be included within Article 155. Well, I don't know who defended or uh, who, who was on the side of defenders of Catalan democracy, but uh, that particular vote in the Spanish Congress should have been enough for the Spanish Constitutional Court to say, no, this, this is not constitutional. Uh, well, it didn't by the unanimous verdict was that this was, uh, this was uh, constitutional. Well, you just have to read the text of the article to realize that this is gross travesty of justice. Um, people say in, in Spain constantly, Puigdemont, President Puigdemont is a fugitive from justice. Well, a lot of people in Catalonia feel that he's a fugitive from injustice. In other words, it's, it's only international or Belgian or German courts uh, that can look at the issue in uh, an, a, a balanced way and not um, reach, let's say, foregone conclusions uh, that, uh, that he is guilty or that he can be accused of rebellion or, or sedition. What does sedition mean? I mean, for me, it's, it's a military concept. Well, not a single 
shot was fired by the Catalans on October the 1st during the referendum, which in fact, organizing a referendum is not illegal under the criminal code, as I'm sure most listeners and, and viewers know. So it is really not clear what particular actions were committed by people who have been sentenced to 10, 11, 12 years in, in prison. It, it isn't clear from the verdict of the Supreme Court in, in, in uh, 2019, it's not clear what it is they did that was um, that justified their being uh, condemned to such long prison terms. But that again is probably more for my next book <laughs> than for uh, this particular book, uh, Lying for Unity. Uh, thanks, Michael. I'd like to ask you something because from the scholar, uh, that's quite a different perspective comparing to England or Ireland, especially because of the independence movement here. As all of you are aware, uh, Scotland had uh, their own independence referendum back in 2014, and unfortunately, the no wins for Scotland. But uh, it looks like that now, after the Brexit, uh, the Scottish independence movement is raising quite fast um, than before it was. Uh, and the, the concern is, or one of my concerns is, do you think that, that media manipulation uh, also be, can be done and this, in the same terms uh, in Scotland? And if so, do you have any piece of advice uh, to the support of, of independence here in Scotland? Um, thanks for the question. I am, I'm not a specialist on Scotland, though I do follow um, news quite, quite closely. And um, I have a, a number of Scottish friends who keep me in touch with the main issues. I remember back in 2014, well, I mean, there was an official yes and official no teams, you know? So, I mean, it's very much like a football match. Uh, with um, the, the, uh, the 11 players on each side, and the person who was going to decide was, in fact, the whole of the Scottish electorate. So when you say, fortunately, uh, the Scottish people voted against, I, I would query that. I was, asked for, um, I was asked for my public support for Scottish independence, and I said, it's up to the Scottish people. Uh, they were manipulated. I know they were manipulated. They were offered, uh, again, una lluvia de millones, a, a very substantial uh, increase in, in finance, which I don't think has, has uh, materialized. And uh, of course, they, they were promised that they would stay in the European Union at the time, you know, rather than being kicked out. So I think the media at that time, those issues, plus pensions, um, were. Uh, for a long time, it seemed as though people would lose their pensions in Scotland. The same went on in uh, Catalonia. I know there was a, a Spanish delegation sent to um, uh, London because in the end, you know, the, the strategy was obviously organized in London uh, to get information on how to uh, uh, get rid of or defeat independence movements. But I doubt that London would uh, suggest putting uh, summoned or, or the current uh, first minister in, in prison for organizing a referendum, quite honestly. So I'd say that the parallels are there. Uh, I really hoped that, Catholic, that uh, Scotland would vote in favor, but I, I can't say unfortunately, because that, that's very subjective. And, and uh, I, I think we, we should respect the decision of uh, people, uh, provided they've been well informed. And in, in the Brexit referendum, for instance, that was absolute classic case of um, misinformation and disinformation on all sides. And um, no one valued uh, in its true perspective, the, the outcome or the, the results of uh, a no vote. Yeah, uh, quite right. Thank you. Thank you for, for your qualifications. Um, do you think, um, that there's um, anything that you can say to the Scots? Um, just go for it. Um, go out, explain to friends. If pubs have opened, explain in the pubs uh, the reasons why the Scottish people would be better off 
uh, as an independent, um, recovering their independent status. When I say better off, I don't mean that necessarily in financial terms. Uh, you can probably be, be better off um, organizing your own system in your own way, even if it's with uh, less uh, money in, in your hand. So I don't think money in the end is, is the main issue, but, uh, and I think people have learned a lot from the first referendum. And I think that has, that nail has to be uh, really struck into, into people's, not mind, sorry, that sounds a bit violent, um, thinking uh, uh, so that um, when the next time comes, uh, which I hope will be soon, uh, the uh, uh, a number of Scots people will will change their vote and vote uh, yes this time. Yeah. I think that the the Spanish monarchy has been extremely centralist, and you can say well, well the British the, the the English way of seeing things and running things has also been centralist. But you know, I'm thinking of some. The, the Scots Guards or the Irish Guards or the Welsh Guards, the kind of international games between Scotland and, and Wales and Ireland, the whole of Ireland and uh, Scotland. This, this kind of recognition of the existence of a people, even if they're part of a, of a, a united kingdom, I think that is very important. And that has almost never been accepted inside uh, Spain, certainly since the Bourbons uh, took over in, in the early 18th century. The Habsburgs were more used to plural societies, so they had to run, you know, uh, Austria and Bulgaria and Hungary and uh, Serbia and the rest of it. So they were much more flexible in allowing um, self-government to a very large extent, much more respectful of languages. And, you know, you, you look at Ministry of Justice websites, as I did this morning, I, it actually offers the choice of languages at the top. I think, wow, well, that's a big step forward from Franco's day. But if you click on Catalan, um, the, all the information that comes out for Atención al Ciudadano, uh, serving uh, the, uh, the citizen, is all in Spanish. So you know, it, it's just lip service. Uh, to uh, a, a continuing uh, attempt to abolish um, Catalan-speaking um, people and Galician-speaking and Basque-speaking. And, and they're doing quite well, unfortunately. They're doing quite well. Well, since we were talking about Scotland, there is a question for the audience, from the audience, from Pep in the chat. Uh, let me read it. So this is says one question. I've had some conversations with Scottish that support independence, and they say wish London uh, had behaved like Madrid. Scottish independence would have been a lot likely. In Catalonia, we do have Madrid behaving like bullies, uh, which is what Scotland would have loved to reach well over 50% of support. Uh, why Catalonia seems incapable of taking advantage of this attitude from Madrid to ensure the support of independence, uh, which is well above uh, 50%. So <laughs> what would you reply to okay. this question? Um, uh, I'll talk a bit about sociology, the, the, the demography of both countries. If you look at where people living in Scotland come from, they're either from the European Union, well, sorry, firstly, most of them are from Scotland. There's a large contingent of people from Poland or France or other European countries, but they can't vote in a referendum on independence. Uh, and there are some English born people in, in Scotland, of course there are, but they, they don't amount to a substantial proportion of the electorate. If you look at the Catalan electorate um, and you ask people, uh, voters, uh, potential voters, um, how many of your four grandparents were born in Catalonia? Over half of them will say none. In other words, the in-migration into Catalonia from particularly Andalusia uh, and, and uh, Extremadura and Castilla, the southern part of Castilla and Murcia in the 1950s, 60s until 
the oil crisis in 1973 was enormous, enormous. And you can see that uh, in the voting patterns very clearly. If you look at people's origin, the, the, more, the more grandparents born in Catalonia people have, uh, the more the overwhelming uh, majority of people want independence. So it's very much a, a roots issue. If you're a first generation immigrant from the rest of Spain, 90% will be against independence. Some of that 90% say, okay, this is up to the Catalans to decide, so we wouldn't vote in a referendum in, on independence. Okay, but that, that's a minority. And then if you look at people who were born in Catalonia only, we have a clear majority in favor of independence, even though a high proportion of those are the offspring of those uh, people who had no, for, uh, no uh, grandparents at all born in Catalonia. So I think the explanation is very much, um, I can't call it an ethnic issue, but uh, a matter of roots, of identity, of um, um, feeling part of belonging to, uh, but that doesn't make the independence movement as such an identity movement. And this is one of the uh, arguments that uh, the Spanish unionists have, have um, given quite often. Uh, it, it, quite deliberately, the Catalan independence movement has been talking about how everyone, including people who are against independence, will be better off in an independent Catalonia. And eth ethnic issues have been completely left out on the Catalan side. On the unionist side, wow, you know, the day has 24 hours. So they have been very keen to try and project uh, an ethnic interpretation of the Catalan independence movement, which is simply not true. I mean, there are some people, yes. But uh, in the main, and the official discourse is very, very clear on this. So with respect to the, to the question, you think that uh, it will never happen that uh, Boris Johnson will send the uh, police troops to the harbor of Edinburgh to beat the uh, people voting in polling stations? Uh, mm. So will this ever happen in, in the UK? <laughs> Uh, I hope that's a, a question which is rhetorical. Well, in fact, I mean, simply it is, not the way it is to very solve rhetorical. problems. Uh, Scotland has had a referendum. Okay, it could have another one. Uh, Ireland has agreed that a referendum will be held for the Northern Irish to decide whether they want to uh, reunite with the rest of the of the island. So, I think uh, in the DNA of British politics, the idea that people have to vote on their future is uh, it clearly prevails. Maybe I'm, you know, out of date. <laughs> I'm out of date on a lot of things because I've lived in Catalonia for, for so long. But uh, I, I think in this particular issue, uh, democratic values uh, will certainly prevail. Uh, at the very worst, uh, let's say when when Scotland was preparing its uh, first referendum uh, in, in this latest uh, drive of referenda, um, a, 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 I think a white book or blue book or red book, a green book, must be in a white paper, a very detailed uh, discussion of the consequences of um, independence and what would need to be done if uh, Scotland became independent. Catalonia had its own, uh, which was largely translated into English if anyone's interested. And there, the, the main issue was if Spain agrees, if Spain doesn't agree. But nowhere in the whole of that 700 page uh, collection of chapters did anyone, did anyone contemplate the use of violence to stop uh, to try and stop the referendum taking place or the political repression that uh, has been um, uh, a phenomenon in the, in the last four four years. No one, no one expected that. So, well, I have a couple of examples that I would like to, to show. Uh, the first case is 
how is how can I share the screen? Yeah, no. The first case is Josep Burrell, which mm -hmm. I think I believe it it takes an important part. Uh, in, well, as a role in the narrative for Spain. Sorry, you can't hear it, right? Isn't you can't? Okay. Well, uh, basically, he lost control during an interview. Uh, well, while he was being asked about the situation of Karma Furcadell, who was in pretrial detention, well, basically being in prison without, uh, yeah, having had a, a fair uh, trial. Uh, <laughs> I, I like this this sentence here. Uh, well. I understand, well, the right questions, make me the right questions uh, to the interviewer. That's a, <laughs> a bad habit, right, from uh, for, uh, for a politician, at, at least. Uh, and well, I, in the end, he said, stop it. And he basically quitted the interview because the interviewer was doing the questions he didn't like. So uh, this happened while he was uh, the, the foreign affairs minister of Spain. Now he's the foreign affairs minister, how would you call it, of the European Union, right? Uh, so, yeah, well, Spain has a, a full diplomacy, which is co constantly fighting against his... Uh, against independence movement, independentist movement. It was a uh, you to uh, Arancha Gonzalez Laya, the the, fair, the, the current uh, foreign affairs minister, and she also well he got very angry in Estonia when she was asked about the situation of Carlos Puigdemont. Uh, well, uh, how should we uh, all the? I mean, in the end. Um, Spain has plenty of funding to, well, its own diplomacy as a as a full state of uh, of any other state in the world. Uh, in the end, well, we we have our poor self government tools, which are very poor, very constrained, as we know. Uh, how should we face all this this information? All this, how should we counteract this uh, narrative that doesn't? Doesn't match well with the reality of Catalonia. How, how, what would you do? What should we prioritize, Michael? Um, that's a very good question, and you're quite right. Uh, diplomacy is an extremely important uh, aspect of the whole process, and uh, Spain has been extremely active diplomatically, trying, for instance, to prevent universities putting on um, seminars to discuss the issue of Catalan independence. Uh, or a well-known Catalan writer who wanted to uh, present, he was invited by the Cervantes Institute, which is for the promotion of Spanish culture uh, in, um, in Holland, in the Netherlands. And uh, they put on this uh, presentation and the, the ministry went, uh, went mad because they didn't want this man to present his book on uh, Catalonia, it was, you know, it's in the mid 18th century he was talking about, but even that for them was uh, scandalous. Uh, so they have been extremely active. Um, it's cost them a lot of money. I mean, the uh, previous um, Minister of Foreign Affairs uh, said that uh, the uh, efforts in the, in the Baltic states, for instance, uh, included uh, sending uh, units of the, of the Spanish Air Force or uh, Spanish armed forces uh, to uh, support uh, or to help defend the frontier with uh, Russia. So a lot has been uh, invested or spent by Spain, lush publications full of half lies uh, and outright uh, manipulation to try and persuade poor, ignorant uh, foreign diplomats or foreign ministries in other countries that the Catalan cause uh, has um, no justification uh, for the reasons that uh, we discussed uh, briefly, um, and that uh, therefore they should not uh, issue any kind of support for even self-determination, even if they said we are against uh, Catalans becoming independent, but we support their right to, no, not even that was accepted. 
uh, and Julian Assange from the um, was it the Peruvian embassy in London for for uh, much much too long, and his present uh, situation, of course, is uh, very dire, and I think improper of of a modern democratic uh, Western state. Um, he never said he was in favour of uh, uh, independence, but he did from that embassy uh, uh, send uh, several tweets supporting the Catalans' right to decide their own future. Well, even that was portrayed as part of the Russians' uh, offensive to try and manipulate uh, the, the uh, independence results when he, he wasn't in favor of a yes. So they, they have been, let's say, um, acting in a sort of knee-jerk style to every initiative of uh, the Catalan government on the para-diplomatic field, obviously can't be diplomatic. They fired, uh, well, they sent home uh, a Flemish uh, diplomat uh, from Madrid who was following um, the uh, Catalan events uh, very closely. I, I met him a number of times. And uh, all in all, um, they've now called to trial the, the leaders of that para or semi-diplomatic uh, uh, service that uh, was closed down immediately by Rajoy under Article 155. And he again, uh, well, uh, there are several of them there, will be facing prison sentences for mis misuse of, of public funds. Well, all these funds went through all the controls in the Catalan um, uh, institution. I'm going to say government, no, the government doesn't control the uh, what exactly is spent because you have uh, people who can uh, prevent uh, expenses uh, being uh, paid out if uh, the law isn't complied with. So they don't have a, uh, they really don't have any grounds to support these uh, accusations, but they will all be found guilty, uh, no question. Yeah, well, since we have been talking about your book track for one hour already. Let, let me have a, another question, <laughs> which is, how, well, we haven't discussed that. Uh, well, in the last pages of your book, uh, you talk about the COVID pandemic and, well, communi mm -hmm. communication issues mm -hmm. uh, related to it. So why did you decide, well, that this was important matter to be included in the book? Um, can you explain the audience a little? or okay. summarize a little bit. <laughs> right at the beginning, uh, I, I did point out that I had read uh, an essay on the subject suggesting that the pandemic w was being used by the Catalan independence movement to further its cause. Uh, and I think that was a, a disgusting claim. Uh, it was based on uh, a tweet by Clara Ponsati, uh, well known in, in Scotland and uh, probably the only MEP living in the UK right now. <laughs> Although of course she doesn't represent uh, any uh, constituency in, uh, in uh, the UK and she doesn't represent any constituency in Spain for that matter because it's a single constituency country uh, which is very unusual for such a large country. Uh, you know, Wales or Scotland have had their MEPs for uh, parts, particular parts of the country. Spain has refused to do that. And my suspicion is that they wanted to try and keep uh, uh, independence parties or nationalist parties, their, their own parties, of course, are not nationalists, um, out of, uh, out of the, the European political picture. Um, so uh, Clara said um, she, she saw the, the number of people dying in Madrid, which was much superior to the number of people dying in other parts of Spain, particularly in Catalonia. Uh, and she tweeted, uh, De Madrid al Cielo, which is a long standing pro Madrid um, sort of uh, drum bashing uh, slogan saying that once you've been to Madrid, you, you're on the road to, to, to heaven. Well, it's a highway to heaven rather than highway to hell, uh, which was used as a slogan. Well, she repeated that. Uh, in fact, she was forced to actually delete it because so many people took offense at what was actually happening. But Madrid had a far worse 
record in the pandemic than did uh, Catalonia, uh, and that Spain took its early measures much too late. Much too late means a couple of weeks maybe at the beginning of the pandemic, and that uh, that had caused a large, large number of, of, um, of deaths which could have been avoided. Since Catalan politicians said we would have uh, applied the measures more quickly and saved more lives, or well, this was support for the independence movement in the eyes of the author of this particular, of this essay. So that really was the, the, the initial reason for, um, for writing my book and the fact that uh, I, I claim that, um, that uh, it is untrue that the independence movement has grown stronger thanks to the uh, pandemic. Why? Because one of the cornerstones of the independence movement is a popular mobilization, people out on the streets. Well, you know, for, for a year, there was no opportunity for any uh, large scale public demonstrations like the huge rallies that the, the um, uh, Catalan National Assembly, which both you, Enrique and, and Laura represent, and that in fact uh, started in Arrange the Moon, uh, uh, thanks to well, uh, an encounter with a friend of mine. And we both said, I've been thinking about the present state of the uh, independence movement. This was 2009. Uh, why don't, you know, I've been thinking, wouldn't it be nice to have an umbrella association to kind of get people to agree on what strategy to use? And I said, Peter, I quite agree with you. Uh, you've taken the words out of my mouth. So. Peter and I, with a couple more uh, friends uh, in the end, uh, started working on the project and we developed it in, in a, a spiral fashion, uh, getting each new group to decide on who more would be invited to come in and read our initial documents and pr present their amendments and improvements. And that has grown into an association, as you know, that has uh, over 40,000 paid up members, and that number again of, of people who um, totally agree and sympathize with, uh, with the movement. And then election results in the end, which of course is, the ANC has never been directly involved in elections. Uh, election results have continued to show constant, consistent support for independence. And this time round, the number of um, uh, MPs voted into the parliament who are in favor of independence is, is well over half now. Um, half would have been 68, we have 74. So um, in, in that sense, maybe the pandemic, coming back to your question, Enrique, maybe the pandemic had something to do with those results in, in whatever way. Certainly the turnout was much lower and the, the turnout was much lower and allowed the sort of neo-fascist Spanish nationalist party Vox to get into uh, the parliament, uh, which was widely expected, but we hoped it wouldn't have had uh, the, the number of um, MPs that, uh, that it has right now. Thanks, Michael. A uh, very interesting uh, present book presentation. Uh, we are all looking forward to see uh, at some point in the future, future your book on the UK bookshop shelves. Uh, I know, as you mentioned before, that probably right now it's not happening. But in the meantime, can you remind us uh, where we can find your book, please? Okay. Um, my book was published by uh, Cookwood Press, which is a small publishing company based in the States. And what we said was, let's not actually run the book uh, with a fixed number of um, printed copies. Let's leave the printing of the book in the hands of Amazon. Uh, let's say, sad to say, but uh, I had tried to find uh, a, a, an English speaking world publisher. Um, perhaps I, I looked in the wrong direction, but I had several no's uh, because this particular book didn't fit into their collections which were largely uh, some medieval history or uh, modern literature, um, just not too, not close enough to what this book is, which is 
halfway between uh, some journalism and uh, political science, if you like. So we decided to leave the um, paperback in the hands of Amazon. So anyone going to Amazon and uh, looking for lying for unity will find my book. There's no other book with the same name. Uh, and people in other countries, English speaking countries, can go to Barnes and Noble or to Kobo. And again, looking for uh, lying for unity can order the book uh, through them, but uh, in ebook form. And um, there's a Kindle edition, which is, let's say, Amazon's ebook uh, format. And um, so the, 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 the ebook can be you know, downloaded on the spot. You, you pay for it and you get it. And the other one takes a few days, uh, but sometimes some people have received it in, in a couple of days. Some have had to wait for a week. I, I, got, it the, I got it the day after. Uh, I, bought, uh -huh. uh, I purchased through uh, Amazon. And okay. the day after, I got it at home. <laughs> okay, I, I had to wait a few days. The <laughs> Yeah, uh, thank you. We don't want to reveal too much. Probably that's up, up to the people who'd like to read your book uh, and to discover what's in there. Uh, and I have no doubt that it's quite interesting. Uh, thank you so much for being here, for explaining um, about the book you, you write about. Uh, in, in regards from ANC England, ANC Ireland and ANC Scotland, thank you, thank you so much. Also, thank you for the audience for following us at uh, this event. Remind everybody that this will be available online on the YouTube of ANC England uh, for the future. Um, if you have any comment, please let us know. Remind yourself, please, uh, we'd like you to follow ANC England, ANC Ireland, and ANC Scotland YouTube channels. All our events at the minute are published in there. So please follow all of three us. We'll love to see increase our followers. Uh, and again, um, happy San Jordi tomorrow to all of you. Uh, and see you next time. Bye-bye. Okay. Thank you very much, Michael, for your talk. Very interesting book, also, by the way. Bye-bye. <laughs> OK, thank you very much. Bye-bye to all people who Call me Michael and uh, they all thought it was going to be one Michael. There we go. <laughs>